Good morning, everyone. I'm Umbrish Dino, and I'm back again with another episode of Teaching Points Recap VMR, held every first Tuesday of the month. And I'm Umbrish Dino. I am a proud member of the CP Solvers Academy. And today is a particularly exciting day for me because it's my son Ryan's fourth birthday. And uh, I also have three very special girls from our CP Solvers Academy team, Tansu, Kuchal, and Anmol, who have picked three very interesting and unique cases from the recent VMRs. And I'm thrilled to have you all join us today. Thank you for being here. And without much ado, I'm going to have my girls, Tansu, followed by Anmol. Actually, Anmol will go first, but I'll just have you girls talk to us and tell us a little bit about yourself. So uh, very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone present. My name is Anmol Preet Kaur, and I am an international medical graduate from India. I'm interested in the field of internal medicine, and uh, I am a CP Solvers member. and excited for today's presentation. Thank you, Anmol. Super proud of you. This is your second time, I believe, right? Yes. All right, go ahead, Tansu. Hello, friends. Uh, welcome, and thank you so much for being with us today. And happy birthday to Ryan. <laughs> what a special day. Um, my name is Tansu. I'm from Turkey. Uh, currently, I live in New York, and I applied for internal medicine residency in this match cycle. Um, I became a Teaching Points Recap via my regular. This is my third time. I'm very excited that you are here, um, and we are going to reason through uh, some cool cases. Thank you, Tansu. Ryan is going to send you a voice note thanking you later on. And thank you for bringing in a very special case every first Tuesday. And Kuchal, who is one of our most recent and newest members, this is her first time. And Kuchal, would you like to tell us what do you do? Hey, hi, everyone. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Um, and uh, Umbish is being an amazing lead for organizing the whole thing. And I'm a proud member of the CP Solvers. And um, I am interested in primary care. Lovely. I hope everybody who's here has applied this cycle matches finger crossed for all of you and myself. I've also applied for internal medicine. And let's get started, girls and more. Let's get you on the stage first. Okay. So I'll share my screen now. Perfect. Um, okay, so starting with my presentation, um, the title of my presentation is Rare or Underdiagnosed. Um, so basically, I will be reviewing two beautiful cases which were discussed in January, one discussed on January 13 and one on January 15. Talking about my first case and its problem representation. It was the case of uh, an 82-year-old woman who presented with two unrelated and uh, different non-specific symptoms like progressive shortness of breath and a right wrist pain. And upon evaluation, we realized that she had a past history of smoking and COPD. And four months prior, she experienced worsening, uh, like ex worsening shortness of breath, which was accompanied by dry cough. And the inhaler for COPD was also changed, but it did not provide any relief. And regarding the right wrist pain, this patient, um, she reportedly sprained her right wrist and it actually looked red and swollen as well. And the only abnormal findings she, at that time she had were, was uh, elevated blood pressure, leukocytosis and raised inflammatory markers. So uh, imaging was done for this shortness of breath. In fact, it was just thought that it could be acute exacerbation of COPD, it could be heart failure, it could be malignancy, but the imaging did not reveal any um, any remarkable findings. And the, uh, for the right wrist pain, it was thought to be fracture or was thought to be septic arthritis, and the X-ray of right wrist was also unremarkable. But the story did not end here. This patient, he, she came back again two months later and this time her shortness of breath had worsened and both of the right wrists had swollen. Um, so uh, what happened next? We did the imaging, we repeated the imaging, but this time we focused more on the airways. Initially it was a CT negative shortness of breath. We focused more on the air, uh, airways and we saw that this patient had diffuse tracheal collapse. 
So what do you think can uh, be the cause of uh, like this tracheal disorder? Um, so there are multiple causes. For example, it could be post uh, a traumatic in a uh, post trauma, usually post intubation or tracheostomy, or it could be radiation induced idiopathic subglottic stenosis, which is seen in post menopausal women or saber sheet trachea, which is seen post uh, in COPD patients, amyloidosis or infections like TB. And then uh, bronchoscopy was also done. And uh, these were the biopsy results, which ruled out vasculitis and amyloidosis and all of these things. Then uh, retrospectively, the team noticed a cauliflower deformity of ears and saddle nose in the course of investigation. Therefore, biopsy was done, auricular cartilage biopsy, which showed fibrosis. And this patient was diagnosed as a case of relapsing polychondritis. So how would is, was uh, she diagnosed with this condition? It, there is a Damiani and Levine criteria, which says that if any one of these things is present, plus a positive histologic confirmation, it can uh, diagnose relapsing polychondritis. And our patient had auricular chondritis, non erosive inflammatory arthritis, nasal chondritis, respiratory tract chondritis, and positive histologic confirmation, therefore diagnosed with this condition. Now, actually, what does this uh, whole thing actually mean? Relapsing means uh, worsening after improvement. That is recurrence. And if we divide polychondritis, then poly means multiple, and uh, this is cartilage and inflammation. That is, relapsing polychondritis is in, uh, it's a cyst immune mediated systemic diseases which uh, causes the inflammation in multiple cartilages, cartilaginous tissues of the body. And as we said, uh, polychondritis and polyarthritis are the main manifestations, and we treat it with NSAIDs and immunosuppressants. So this was our first case. And now moving over to our second case. Uh, this was the case. Um, let me show you. Okay. So this was the case of, uh, for, okay, first of all, it was a middle-aged to elderly adult who from the initial complaints, we thought it was a localized inflammation, but no. We, uh, after we dissected the past admissions, we realized it was a, a subacute systemic inflammation affecting many systems in the body. And so uh, if we uh, actually go back, four months ago, uh, this patient had severe right eye pain and swelling, which was diagnosed as orbital cellulitis and was treated with antibiotics. And then uh, it, it, got, uh, af it, res it got resolution after, after the treatment. And two months ago, this patient developed left lower extremity cellulitis. This also was treated with antibiotics. Now, important part in this case is that this patient was having intermittent unresolving fevers for four months, which, was, uh, which were not responding to the antibiotics we were, given for, uh, we were giving the patient for cellulitis. So uh, next, what happened, this patient one and a half months ago had abdominal pain and colonoscopy was done, which showed terminal ileitis. Now there's a question. Uh, if I say that someone has terminal ileitis, what is the first thing that comes to our mind? So actually, the first thing that comes to our mind is Crohn's disease. But do you think anything other than Crohn's disease can cause terminal ileitis? Yes, there are many inflammatory and non-infectious in, uh, in, uh, infectious and non-infectious inflammatory causes which can cause terminal ileitis. For example, Yersinia, TB, uh, like all of these things, uh, sarcoidosis, they can cause terminal ileitis. Uh, all of these things, as you can see on the slide. And uh, then this uh, was also treated, this time also the patient was treated with antibiotics and the fever, they persisted. And uh, next, one month ago, the patient presented with truncal petechial rash and multifocal infiltrates on a CD chest and weight loss. So this uh, petechial rash, it could be thrombocytopenia or it could be leukocytoclastic vasculitis. So it was important to note uh, the platelet count and if normal, it was important to note uh, what was the result of skin biopsy. And one thing I just want to focus here, please remember this multifocal infiltrates we have seen in this patient, we will be referring to it in the next slides. So this time, it was, the patient was treated as a case of community-acquired pneumonia, again with antibiotics. But the problem st is still there. Intermittent fevers every second, third day. Then two weeks ago, the patient presented with bilateral eye pain, uh, uh, which was diagnosed as viral conjunctivitis. And now, uh, since one day, this patient has uh, these chief complaints of jaw pain and left-sided periorbital facial swelling, which progressively included the left eye. 
if we see in every admission, the patient had different symptoms and it involved different systems. So can you just see collectively what the problem representation was? The problem representation of this patient was a 66 year old male presenting with multi-system inflammatory disease with unresolving intermittent fever for four months, unresponsive to antibiotics. This was our problem representation. In this patient, the only past medical history he had was of BPH and temperature was 100.9 at this point of time. And if we think um, uh, these recurrent infections of the eye makes us think of uveitis, but worth mentioning here is that off the consult was done and uveitis, uh, uveitis was ruled out. Um, so then uh, this patient also had left parotid swelling and tenderness, which raises concerns for uh, IgG4 disease too. So there were so many differentials coming to our mind, TB, sarcoidosis, which can affect all these systems together in uh, this terminal ileitis, lungs and eyes. And uh, so then this patient uh, definitely, it, uh, we thought that his inflammatory markers would be high. And that's what we saw in the labs. He had raised inflammatory markers. Then he had macrocytic anemia, normal platelet counts, and borderline leukocytosis. And regarding the macrocytic anemia, uh, we all know that it is divided into megaloblastic anemia, non-megaloblastic anemia. So what is the difference? Difference is the hypersegmented neutrophils. They're present in megaloblastic and absent in non-megaloblastic. Uh, and uh, the uh, pathophysio behind is that imp there's impaired DNA synthesis in megaloblastic, mostly due to vitamin B12 and folate deficiency. And uh, there is normal DNA synthesis in non-megaloblastic anemia. But this patient had normal B12 and folate levels. Um, next, coming over to mildly elevated LFTs, mild proteinuria, ANCA negative and normal complement levels. And then uh, HIV was negative and the hepatitis panel was negative as well. Now for the associated symptoms, imaging was done. MRI head and orbits was done and which showed ill-defined infiltration of the left face. And uh, uh, after that for the chest imaging, CTPE was also done for the pleuritic chest pain the patient once had and for the recurrent fevers, which showed small left-sided pleural effusion. And uh, uh, we also did CT abdomen and pelvis uh, for which an indeterminate liver lesion was seen. Now, I asked you to remember one term from the last slide that was infiltration. We saw infiltration on the CT chest uh, in the last slide of this patient. Again, you can see that on this slide, we can again see this term infiltration. Infiltration of the left face. What do you think infiltration is? What, uh, what are infiltrative disorders and what can infiltrate? These were some of the questions I had. So when I actually read about it, I realized that uh, infiltration means something that has come into an area in excess of normal, right? So uh, that was something I realized it's diffusion or accumulation of foreign substances in amounts excess of the normal. And then what can infiltrate? So in our body, what can infiltrate? They can be cells and they can be molecules. And if I talk about cells, if we talk about the basic CBC and then uh, the differentials, uh, the, all of those cells, they can infiltrate. For example, uh, we can have infiltration of neutrophils, eosinophils, monocytes, which can turn to macrophages, uh, lymphocytes, mast cells, molecules like amyloid uh, and uh, metals like iron. So whenever they infiltrate, what do they cause? They cause infiltrative disorder. This is what are infiltrative disorders. That is what my, my questions were and I searched about it. So I realized that these all of these things which are mentioned on the screen in red, they are the infiltrative disorders. And these are the infiltrates. Um, next, we come back to the, uh, the case. And so the patient was having recurrent fever. So infectious panel, most of it was ruled out. A respiratory panel, gastrointestinal panel, your seniors, everything was ruled out. And uh, so this patient was actually having fever and inflammation of unknown origin. For that, PET scan was done, which showed no lesion suggestive of occult solid tumor, but diffusely increased uptake throughout the bone marrow and spleen and focal uptake localizing to aortic arch. Because of the uptake localizing to aortic arch, CT angiogram was done which showed the thickening of the thoracic aorta and it uh, raised concerns for a large vessel vasculitis and because he had diffusely increased uptake throughout the bone marrow and spleen so for that bone marrow biopsy was done which was hypercellular with myeloid hyperplasia and the most important thing myeloid precursors show frequent cytoplasmic
vacuoles. So what are the conditions do you think which can cause uh, frequent cytoplasmic vacuoles in the myeloid precursors? There are many conditions. For example, zinc toxicity, copper deficiency, alcohol abuse, myelodysplasia, antibiotic treatment, and Vexus syndrome. Also, this patient had normal copper levels. So this patient, uh, UBA1 gene mutation was tested and it came out to be positive and the patient was diagnosed as a case of Vexus syndrome. So what is actually UBA1 gene? Um, it is a gene which is located on the X chromosome. And since it is a gene, it will encode for a protein and this gene encodes for an enzyme that is E1 enzyme. Um, that is the key enzyme in this whole process that is ubiquitin activating enzyme. What is this important for? It is important for ubiquitin proteasome system. What is this ubiquitin proteasome system? Whenever uh, there are proteins in our body which can uh, fold um, in a wrong way or the proteins which the body does not need, they are degraded by the ubiquitin proteasome system. And the E1 is the most, the first enzyme which is uh, involved in this process. How do, how do the body recognize which protein to degrade and which to not to degrade? Ubiquitin molecules are added to the protein and that's how the proteasome recognizes that. So first, uh, so this ubiquitination has three steps, activation, ubiquitin activation, conjugation, and ligation. So this, as the name suggests, ubiquitin activating enzyme activates ubiquitin and this is how i will represent the um, molecules so ubiquitin this is the activated ubiquitin and e1 enzyme upon which e2 is acted which is the conjugating enzyme and the uh, ubiquitin moiety is, uh, is transferred to the e2 molecule and after that uh, the next enzyme acts that is e3 that is ubiquitin ligase uh, which uh, which actually transfers the activated ubiquitin to the target protein, like this. And this cycle continues, and this uh, actually becomes a polyubiquitinated protein, which is then recognized by the proteasome and then degraded. Uh, so this UBA1 gene mutation is, uh, when it is, uh, UBA1 gene is mutated, it is it happens in two conditions. That is X-linked infantile spinal muscular atrophy, and the second, as we discussed, is Vexus syndrome. So what is Vexus syndrome? Uh, every letter has its meaning. V, and we have discussed most of it. V stands for vacuoles in the bone marrow. And E stands for E1 ubiquitin activating enzyme, which is encoded by the UBA1 gene, which is mutated. X, X means UBA1 gene is located on the X chromosome, and therefore this disease is more common in males. A stands for auto-inflammatory disease. And S it stands for that the mutations, they are somatic and they're not inherited. They are acquired at some point in life. Um, so when I was just seeing this, I uh, I didn't understand the term auto-inflammatory disease. And when I realized what it is, because I was like, what is it? Uh, is it, is it autoimmune or is it inflammation? Uh, so I actually realized that it is an immune mediated disorder only. It happens because of immune uh, system dysregulation. And uh, it is not autoimmune per se. Um, basically, if we discuss that our immune system is divided into innate immune system and acquired immune system. Innate immune system is something that uh, first uh, detects the presence of an antigen and summons the adaptive immune system. And adaptive immune system also remembers the antigen, so also it develops self-tolerance. And when that self-tolerance is gone, then what arises? Autoimmune diseases. Yeah, so uh, there, there's the presence of an antigen and innate immune system is antigen independent, adaptive is antigen dependent. But when the uh, they recognize the uh, body cells, then uh, I would say that when adaptive immune cells lose their ability to maintain self-tolerance of human cells, that's when autoimmune diseases arise. And when the innate immune uh, cells, they, the mutation in the genes that control and regulate innate immune cells, then what arises is auto-inflammatory disease. So that's what I made out of it. And since Vexus is a very new disease entity, um, I just uh, searched upon uh, many, research many researches and I realized what the classical clinical features for Vexus are. So these are some of the uh, classic clinical features and what our patient had. Our patient was a male, had fever, had skin involvement, had pulmonary infiltrates, macrocytic anemia, and bone marrow vacuoles. So um, that was uh, what I actually uh, saw in this case. And uh, regarding the treatment, 
if we talk about vexus um so this patient uh, actually there's no uh, developed pro treatment pro protocol for vexus but uh, and it is very unresponsive unresponsive to treatment and glucocorticoids have substantial toxicity so many researches are being done and people are thinking about tocilizumab and jak2 inhibitors uh, so if the, those things are being considered as a part of treatment and uh, um, so that was about uh, vexus syndrome and why I chose two cases today. The first one, it was diagnosed as a case of relapsing polychondritis. The second one, it was diagnosed as a case of vexus syndrome. I chose these two cases because they are an association to each other. Uh, the, in the patients who are diagnosed as relapsing polychondritis, it's important to check if they are having vexus syndrome too. What are the things we can look for if we want to check that? Um, so what are the, one is male gender, obviously, because it's an excellent disease, it's more common in males. Number two is mac uh, macrocytic anemia, high MCV. And number three is low platelet count. So we have to think about these things uh, because, um, because the treatment varies when we think about both of these things. And for the last, I would uh, love to share a line from Harrison which says that vexus syndrome should be considered in male patients with relapsing polychondritis who have hematologic abnormalities in the spectrum of myelodysplastic syndrome, fevers, venous thrombotic events, pulmonary infiltrates, cutaneous lesions, or treatment-resistant disease. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for listening to me, and these are my references. Uh, thank you so much. Whoa, and whoa. Super, super impressed. Everybody was typing, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I was looking at everyone. They were all smiling, super focused and trying. No, I was trying not to type in the chat because I was like, I, don't, I do not want to miss a single point of this excellent presentation. And I know it took you hours to compile two very complicated diseases and bring them together in such a short amount of time. So thank you for putting in the effort. And I hope that you can catch some good sleep after this. I know it's your bedtime. And I really appreciate this. Just before we move on to Tansu, I would again like to highlight one take home point from your presentation that I'm going to remember that Wexus syndrome is a newly diagnosed entity and it is an autoinflammatory condition, just like relapsing polychondritis. And I will not forget UBA1 gene, the way you delved into the depths of it. I'm never going to forget it. So thank you so much. And let's move on to Tansu now. All right, can you see my screen? Awesome. All right, so I'll be presenting you the case that was presented by Parisa to Robbie and Austin on January 25th. And it was a very interesting case for many reasons, but I will share two reasons why I picked this case. Uh, first of all, RLR had a case challenge um, that the same week that Parisa presented this case to Robbie and Austin. And um, in, that was a very interesting case. And the second reason was because I recently listened to a CP Solvers um, podcast episode, episode 281, uh, where Dr. Anand Patel uh, mentioned that uh, pancytopenia was um, one of the most common, if not the most common uh, reason for uh, both inpatient and outpatient um, consult for hematology. So I thought um, we should go over this very important topic um, once together. It would be um, good for my learning and your learning too. So let's go. All right, so in uh, this case, we had a 72-year-old lady with a multitude of comorbidities. Uh, she had type 2 diabetes, hypothyroidism, relapsing remitting MS for 30 years, but she, her disease course was stable on anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, ocrelizumab, uh, with infusions every six months, and her last infusion was two months ago. And at this time, she presented with low back pain, which intensified two days ago with burning sensation, worse with movement, dominant on the left side. And she also had decreased level of energy since two months ago and loss of appetite. Looks like um, a set of non-specific symptoms, but also very meaningful in the context of this patient's comorbidities because all her comorbidities can confer her to have um, asthenia 
And MS specifically can make our patient have both asthenia and neurological true weakness. Um, but neuro, uh, multiple sclerosis usually has a relapsing remitting course. In this patient case, it has a relapsing remitting course. And usually MS relapses are acute to subacute. So um, the patient's low back pain is acute. It started two days ago, but her level of energy decrease and loss of appetite seem to be more chronic uh, for the past two months. And in the review of systems, uh, she didn't have any fever, night sweats, cough, dyspnea, or abdominal pain, and she was able to do her activities of uh, daily living, um, but she still experienced a decreased level of energy. And her medications were appropriate for the comorbidities that she had. Um, and today in her physical exam, it seemed largely unremarkable, especially the organ specific aspects of her physical exam. But what was notable in this patient's physical exam was her heart rate of 98 and the general appearance of polar. And she also had non-palpable purpura in bilateral lower extremities. So it kind of raised the suspicion of maybe a hematologic abnormality from the get-go because uh, the heart rate of 98 and the uh, polar kind of pointed towards um, anemia and the non-palpable purpura in the bilateral lower extremities hinted towards um, a uh, thrombocyte issue because um, of note here, non-palpable palpable purpura is usually um, non-inflammatory and it happens in the cases of vasculopathy or coagulation disorders. And it can be both because of platelet or coagulation factors. So we kind of started uh, having a sense of a hematologic abnormality from her physical exam. And when we looked at her uh, complete blood count at her baseline, which was two months ago, she had a normal hemoglobin, normal platelet, a little low uh, white blood cell count. But today at this visit, the patient had markedly decreased red blood cell count, platelet and white blood cells. So in all three of the cell lines. Um, which shows us that the patient had pancytopenia. And which, uh, what was particularly worrisome was her absolute neutrophil count of 240 per microliter, uh, which was very, very worrisome. Moving on to her other notable labs and imaging. Um, so since uh, our patient had pancytopenia, appropriate um, diagnostic approach was taken. She had a blood smear, which confirmed pancytopenia. And it didn't have no schist it didn't have schistocytes and it had rare blasts. And of note here, um, in the blood smear, in the peripheral blood, we shouldn't see any blasts. And in the bone marrow, um, there's usually uh, what normal is less than 5% of blasts. And in our patient's hematologic markers, she had an LDH of 323. Uh, a B12 level of 1,980, which was markedly elevated, and a reticulocyte uh, percentage of 5.7, which was also elevated because the upper limit of normal is somewhere around 2.5. Um, so we had further hematologic uh, abnormalities. And her infectious serologies were all negative, and the bone marrow biopsy uh, showed a hypercellular um, bone marrow uh, with 17% blast, and um, she had CD34 positive blast with 25% cellularity. In a middle-aged healthy adult, uh, the bone marrow cellularity is around 80% and 20% is adipo adipose tissue. And as, as people age, um, the cellularity of the bone marrow uh, falls, but it doesn't fall as much as 25% cellularity. So um, the abnormality was also confirmed in the bone marrow biopsy and showed, showed us that there was something uh, space occupying in the bone marrow. And um, the FISH analysis showed deletion of chromosome 5 and rearrangement of KMT2A and TP53. And what I found about that that was so interesting is the rearrangement of KMT2A is usually seen, seen in mixed lineage or uh, myeloid lymphoid leukemia type of disorders. And the deletion of chromosome 5 and 7 are usually seen recurrently uh, as non-random abnormalities in AML and are associated with prior exposure to carcinogens 
or leukemic uh, agents, and this confers a poor prognosis. And finally, the diagnosis of AML was made for our patient as therapy-related myeloid neoplasm secondary to her ocrelizumab CD20 uh, monoclonal antibody use. And so um, let's now talk a little bit about pan pancytopenia and what it means and how we can approach to it in the general internal medicine setting. So pancytopenia refers to decrease in all three cell lines, not just one or two, but all of them. And um, the thresholds for the, um, the limits uh, where we say the patient has like a um, white blood cell count less than 4,000 uh, shows a uh, leukopenia, red blood cell count, uh, hemoglobin less than 12, in women and less than 13 in men uh, show us that the patient has anemia. And in the platelets, less than uh, 150K show us that the patient has thrombocytopenia. And um, when we think about um, an approach to pancytopenia, um, the one that was uh, most logical to me and the one that made most sense to me was the 4S approach um, that um, Reza and Rabi came up with, and I love their approach, so I wanted to share that with you. And um, so the 4S mnemonic, uh, when we open it up, when we open that framework up, we see that um, there are uh, basically four buckets, um, four mechanisms for pancytopenia. The first one is systemic causes of pancytopenia. So something is going on in the periphery. Um, and this is usually mediated by uh, the immune system. Uh, and we see this in the case of lupus, for example or in the case of splenomegaly. But splenomegaly is not a terminal uh, diagnosis, it's a peripheral diagnosis, and we need to find out what's causing the splenomegaly. And in the substance category, um, either the absence of certain substances or presence of certain substances can lead to bone marrow suppression. And for example, a B12 folate uh, deficiency or the hormones that are used in the making of the uh, blood cells, uh, deficiency of those can lead to bone marrow suppression. Or if there is alcohol use, heavy alcohol use especially, or methotrexate use, um, then these could also lead to um, a bone marrow suppression. And the space occupying category, um, Anmol uh, really uh, opened it up really uh, well for us in her presentation, the infiltrative disorders. And we can think of those infiltrative disorders uh, in the context of pancytopenia as well. And what could be occupying the bone marrow? And it, these could be from granulomas to malignancy and histiocytic disorders. And in the stem cell category, we have leukemias, aplastic anemia, and MDS. But uh, it's important to note here that um, some, some of these conditions can cause, uh, can, be, can fall into two buckets. For example, leukemia, it can be a space occupying uh, condition, but since it's primarily a stem cell disorder, that's why we categorize leukemia under the stem cell category. And so what are some clues in the history that um, we can look at and try to kind of assess uh, which of these four buckets um, our patient's specific condition can fall into? So the clinical severity is really, really important because it um, gives us an idea about whether we should prioritize the management over diagnosis. But we should not forget to obtain the blood samples before transfusing blood to our patients because we don't want to we don't want to study the transfused blood. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, we need to get our blood samples before transfusions, and we should act promptly if the patient is in a really clinically severe situation. And the time course tells us a lot about um, what, which of these categories we would be dealing with, which of the four S's. Because when we think about um, granulomatous infections, for example, they have a more subacute course than acute course. And leukemias can be acute or chronic, uh, but time course definitely tells us a lot about which bucket we should prioritize. And known medical conditions such as lupus, 
um, in our patient can give us an idea about um, why the pancytopenia might be happening. So we should definitely pay attention to the known medical conditions. And there are many, many medications that can cause um, pancytopenia and up to date has a very comprehensive list on that. Uh, I didn't list every single one of them here, um, but from NSAIDs to common, commonly used blood pressure medications, um, they can cause pancytopenia. Uh, so we really need to uh, examine the patient's medication list. And finally, the center of gravity, uh, as it's important for many chief concerns, it's very important uh, when we see pancytopenia, uh, because if the patient has a systemic signature of the disease um, manifesting itself in uh, multiple systems, then we start looking at um, extra bone marrow. Uh, causes of pancytopenia. But if the patient doesn't have a uh, systemic fingerprint, then we look at more at the bone marrow. So we start thinking about um, lack or excess of certain substances uh, or stem cell disorders. And in our diagnostic approach, um, we consult hematology for pancytopenia, but before consulting hematology, it's good to have certain labs uh, available at hand ordered um, that can really uh, fasten the process uh, for the hematology for diagnosis. And uh, so the first thing that we get is, of course, the complete blood count. And sometimes there can be um, errors in the automated reading. Uh, so we need to sometimes confirm um, the pancytopenia, that the patient truly has pancytopenia. And we also need to get the differential uh, for the blood count and blood type and screen in case our patient um, needs transfusion. And then uh, we get a peripheral blood smear, which can tell us a lot about what's going on. Uh, for example, if we see schistocytes, then we can start thinking about mahas or teardrop cells uh, make us worried about a bone marrow infiltration. Or if we see blasts in the peripheral blood smear, then we start thinking about leukemias. And in the uh, reticulocyte count tells us a lot about the bone marrow's response, whether it's appropriate or inappropriately low. And for that, we need to calculate the reticulocyte index actually. But I didn't involve um, the formula here. It's beyond the scope of this presentation, but you can certainly look it up. And LDH and uric acid give us a clue about the cell turnover. And um, iron studies, ESR, CRP, and LFTs also um, help us prioritize certain causes over the others, especially LFTs. Um, so if the patient, for example, has a chronic liver disease leading to cirrhosis, that could lead to hypersplenism and that can uh, cause um, consum consumption of all three cell lines. And in the additional workup, uh, we look, look at additional um, tests that can um, lead us, that can give us clues about other etiologies. And in here we have copper, zinc, vitamin B12 and folate, so the nutrient deficiencies, um, Coombs test, uh, haptoglobin, SPEP, ANA and ultrasound of the spleen. And ultrasound of the spleen can help us confirm our um, physical exam. If we suspect um, hypersplenism, it can uh, tell us whether there's truly hypersplenism or not. And in the infectious workup, um, we should check for hepatitis B, C, HIV, and tick-borne infections. Tick-borne infections uh, cause more of like peripheral destruction uh, of uh, all three cell lines, but especially um, uh, lymphocytes and platelets more than uh, red blood cells. Uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV can cause both bone marrow suppression, but they can also cause an antibody-mediated distraction of, the, um, of all three cell lines. And so I just want to share uh, three pearls that uh, I took away from this case that I found very interesting. Uh, when I was studying for my step exams, 
I thought about uh, teardrop cells, aka dacrocytes, being specific for uh, bone marrow fibrosis. But I understood that um, they can be found in uh, myelopthesis of any cause. And um, Prof. Rez really explains this so nice. Uh, it's almost like the bone marrow is crying because their home uh, is uh, red blood cells are crying because their home is um, invaded by um, foreign substance, materials, infections. So um, it's a really uh, good way to remember. And high serum cobalamin. Um, and in that case, it was like one of the highest uh, serum cobalamin levels, 1,980. Um, and what we define high serum cobalamin is greater than uh, 950 picograms per milliliter. And in such cases, when we have such high levels of high uh, serum cobalamin, we should consider liver or kidney diseases or other hematologic malignancies. And um, pancytopenia, as I mentioned, um, in how can we prioritize our differential diagnosis? Um, so if there's an extra marrow signature, then we start looking at the periphery. But if there's less extra marrow signature, then we focus on the bone marrow and start thinking that that as a more of a bone marrow issue. And in that case, um, we focus more on substances and stem cell issues. And here are my references. Thank you so much for listening and for joining. Thank you, Tansu. That was such a visually appealing and a beautifully presented case. And you actually took us back to that journey of RLR. And while you were explaining, I could remember how Rabi and Reza were teaching us on that day. And just to go over one important point that I also learned that day, and again, thank you to you for repeating that, are the four S's when approaching pancytopenia. So think of systemic causes, put them into four buckets that Tansu literally visually showed us. So systemic causes, substance space occupying and stem cells. And let's move on to our first presenter and our recent most member, Kuchal. Really excited for your first uh, teaching point recap presentation. Go ahead. Do you guys see anything? Is it visible? It's it's blank right now. You might want to try resharing it. Perfect. You can see it now? Yes. Oh. I'm screening showing as fast as I'll say, spreading as the same distinction. Okay. Yeah. Hi again. I'm so sorry for this small hiccup. Um, so I'm going to be discussing two cases which I have, we saw. And the first one was presented on one, uh, Jan 4th by Dr. Vijay, which was he, the diagnosis was a low risk of um, APS, which was antiphospholipid syndrome and May Turner syndrome. And the second case is uh, presented on by the Yale IM residents on 19th of Jan, which is APS and Rosai Dorfam disease. So I was very intrigued by the fact that both these conditions, which are very complex, and both of them were presenting as young male with between 15 to 25 years old, and they were having uh, other autoimmune disease and multiple system involved, and they were diagnosed with an APS, which is antiphospholipid syndrome. Earlier in during my practice in med school during the steps, I've always seen it being presented as women or pregnant women presenting with multiple abortions and who, who be prescribed in heparin and aspirin later on. So I was very intrigued also by the term low risk APS. So I just knew there was just one APS. So I started studying more about it and then listening to podcasts about it. And what I learned was antiphospholipid syndrome is evolving in terms of diagnosis. And earlier, it was always considered as a part of an SLE, but it's only the past 15 years, it's considered as an independent autoimmune disease. 
So now they're redefining and defining, and there might be changes in this antiphospholipid syndrome characteristics and finding and diagnosis, and now it's going to be managed even in future. So I thought I would present that, and now how it's defined as it's a complex multi-system autoimmune disease, and it's characterized by uh, adverse outcome in pregnancies, what we know of, is for both fetus and the mother, and arterial and venous thrombosis. Those are the two clinical symptoms. And one lab, uh, lab finding should be a consistently raised antiphospholipid syndrome. So during my presentation, I'm just going to go through each one of them and explain them in, uh, in a little bit more. And what is the uh, thrombosis is that whenever a patient less than 50 years present with, a, present with a thrombotic event or whenever anyone has any arterial thrombosis or any unprovoked venous thrombosis or recurrent thrombosis, or if a patient has a thrombotic microangiopathy with unknown etiology, we would want to consider APS and then investigate further for them. So each one of them, and then the other one is pregnancy, and what we uh, what's known is like that, that's going to be a complication both for the fetus as well as the mother, and the loss of pregnant uh, pregnancy about ten weeks or recurrent loss three or more less than ten weeks, we would have to consider APS and investigate them and manage them for that. Or if the patient uh, present Kuchal, with, hmm? I'm so sorry for the interruption. I think we're, we we cannot see your presentation. Your screen is stuck on the first slide. If you could please reshare and then resume. Can you see now? Yes, I believe everyone can see you're on the fifth slide. Okay. So, um... Yeah, so the, what I was going through is that where they have recurrent pregnancy losses at a less than a loss of three or more pregnancies, less than 10 weeks, or loss of pregnancy, even one after 10 weeks, we would have to consider APS and investigate them further for that. Or if the patient present with still births or preeclampsia or eclampsia, and what people have been doing that is that even when women go for infertility treatment, even just as baseline, they start testing them for that and not taking any risk. So the pathophysiology of path, uh, in pregnancy complication, either it's because of thrombosis, usually it affects the placenta, either by thrombosis or the blood in the patient with a antiphospholipid syndrome is sticky blood. So what's happening is that there's the immune-mediated effect of the antibodies against the trophoblast, and that's what's happening. And then there's an ICD code for also the women who's not having any symptoms at all, and they, they but they just have antiphospholipid antibody present, positive in multiple sittings, which is like more than three months or four months, they start treat, uh, they call them as ABS positive, which is asymptomatic women with positive antibodies and start treating them, especially if they would like to, uh, you know, with aspirin, heparin, vitamin D and hydro, uh, hydrochloroquine is also something being tested upon them. And the other thing is now we're going to the lab criteria. What's the commonly tested antibodies for diagnosing APS is either anti-cardiolopin antibodies or anti-beta-2 uh, glycoprotein 1. And the third one is the antiphospholipid antibodies. So uh, as a baseline, these antibodies, whenever we suspect, that is they have recurrent thrombosis, arterial venous, or a person less than 50 years presenting with thrombotic event, or there's an unknown case of microangiopathic, or thrombotic microangiopathic, or recurrent pregnancy loss, or anyone else with any other autoimmune diseases, they are being diagnosed, they all, we test them as in zero, we, uh, first time in week zero, and repeat the test in week 12. So if both the times the tests are positive, which is, and then they would be diagnosed to have an antiphospholipid syndrome. Why in the first patient, which, uh, which it was case, it was diagnosed as a low risk APS and Maytona syndrome is that uh, low risk is because one test was negative and the second test was positive. So there's chance when a person with an autoimmune disease is having an antiphospholipid antibodies can be false positive. So it needs to be repeated after that treatment to see if they continue to have a positive antibody. Only if the, per, the antibodies are persistent, we would diagnose it as as, um, 
case of APS. Otherwise, it could have just been a false positive because of the pre uh, existing coexisting condition of another autoimmune disease. So the debatable um, possible new classification to include is the seronegative APS, uh, and like the seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. That's something which um, uh, you know the rheumatologists are considering to include in that classification, and it's still in debate, and it's not completely or uh, you, you know they do treat it in clinically, but um, and then they just speak about it, but it's not something. Um, and published as a data for diagnosing APS yet. So the types of APS, the primary, which we know about. Secondly, that's the cases which were presented in both our VMRs. One was uh, the, with, associated with Nathoros syndrome, and the other one was associated with Rosai.com. So most commonly, APS is associated with autoimmune disease like SLE. And uh, so that's called a secondary APS. There's a third variety of um, antiphospholipid syndrome, which is known as catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, which has a rapid onset. So you can't really wait for three months time to make a proper diagnosis of antiphospholipid syndrome. So these patients would have really rapid onset, multiple system and organs would be involved, and their mortality is high, as high as 50% if you do not treat them promptly with plasma exchange or steroids or IV immunoglobulins or anticoagulants. So you don't really have that kind of time to wait for three full months to diagnose them as a case of APS. So um, this is also a post um, post mortem finding of them find uh, like saying that patient just died, and then uh, when they did the the post mortem, they found multiple thrombus and multiple organs, and they were trying to say probably it was just the catastrophic APS which wasn't recognized and um, considered. So um, so that's the sum and gist of the APS. If you would like to know more, do read the references which I have over here. And also without fail, uh, go through our VMR episodes because they are, the case itself are very beautifully explained. And due to the lack of time, I'm not going to, going to go through all the symptoms and the presentation of the patients in that. Lovely, Kuchal. That was such a nice and brief and, you know, perfectly sequenced presentation. It was such a complicated case. And Vijay, who presented this case and called it gene or an anatomy, gave us this clue right in the beginning, is also now a team member and he is joining us today. I hope, Vijay, you enjoyed listening to your own case because Kuchal did an excellent job. And I'm glad, Kuchal, that you decided to sign up for this TP recap presentation because clearly you're a natural at this. And we hope to see more teaching from you in future. Thank you again, Chansu, Kuchal, and Anmol for joining us today and bringing in these really interesting diagnoses. And thank you everyone else who is a regular member and those of you who are new. Hope to see you all again first Tuesday of the next month. Take care. Bye-bye.